Thanks for being here. I think we're going to have people coming in late. It seems like when it rains these days and then security things slow down. So I hope you'll make room for people as they come in. Welcome, and again, thanks for being here. I'm Margaret Jones, and I am the 880 Vitality Fellow with the City of St. Paul. And I just want to give you two housekeeping tips. The uh, restrooms are straight down the hall across the, the marble floor and onto the carpet, and then you'll see them on the left side. At least the women's. I'm assuming the men's is down around there, too. And the if you wouldn't mind turning your cell phones off, they probably don't work down here anyway. But just to be on the safe side, let's do that. So again, I am an 18-month fellow. I'm, my position is paid for by the Knight Foundation. And it's based on the philosophy of Gil Penalosa, who is actually here back in 2014 as part of the placemaking residency. And what that means, what 880 means, is that if you create a city that is safe and welcoming for an eight-year-old and safe and welcoming for an 80-year-old, you've created a successful city for all. And that doesn't exclude anybody under the age of eight or over the age of 80. Those are just sort of the indicator <coughs> ages so that we make sure we get everyone covered. And the 880, the work that we're doing is basically we've got five working principles, and they are to ensure that St. Paul puts people first, encourage vitality through investment, both private and public alike, create accessible places where people will connect, where they want to spend time, promote healthy living, and then celebrating the city's cultural diversity in all that we do. So those are basically the, the, uh, the principles, and part of my job is to put together this wonderful series, perspective series, and it's to bring in different speakers from, with different uh, interests and different expertise to just talk about things that we all are interested in. And so I'm so happy that you're here, and I encourage you to uh, be sending out an invitation if you'd like to be on the mailing list to receive further uh, invitations. And you can spread the word far and wide. Everyone is welcome. And I will now turn it over to Jody Petrich. Um, one of the things I'm also come on up working on is doing things in collaboration. And so I've had the pleasure and the opportunity to work with Jody on a couple of collaborative efforts, both around the placemaking residency. But we, we worked together for uh, today's speaker. And then a month ago, we had James Edward Mills and a panel. So it's fun to work with you. Jody is the producer for this wonderful week-long placemaking residency. And just for that alone, and that we started today, and she's pregnant with twins, let's give her a big <laughs> hand. <laughs> she is amazing to work with if you're ever looking for someone to just be awesome. So she's, consult she's a consultant with the St. Paul Riverfront Corporation, and I will turn it over to her. And thank, you, thank you. Thank you so much. Well, good afternoon, everybody. And first of all, I want to start by thanking Margaret in return. She has been an awesome partner. She, we, this year, as we um, formed the fifth annual placemaking residency event and decided to focus on design and equity, we formed an advisory committee. And we had close to 25 different leaders from throughout the community, from nonprofits to government agencies to community organizations, help us in shaping this year's series. And Margaret served on, on that. She also helped put together today's event and hosting today. And the 880 Vitality Fund was a sponsor of the larger series. So um, all of you in the room who are part of um, working with Margaret, um, thank you to all of you for having us today. Um, the Placemaking Residency is an annual series and it's ins intended to inspire conversation about the future of our communities, to build stronger networks among people who care about our cities and to realize the potential of, and strengthen the Twin Cities at a, as a world-class region. And for those of you who are in the room this morning or are coming to any other events, you're gonna hear this a couple times throughout the week, so just bear with me. Um, for the past four years, we've actually brought either an individual or a team of national voices to help us explore a variety of topics that all relate to how we can build better communities together. So this fifth, fifth annual series, we're exploring the intersection of equity and design. And um, many of us know that um, in the next five years alone, billions of dollars are going to be spent in the built environment. And this week, we're exploring how can we address the increasing economic and social disparity in our cities, and how can design contribute to greater equity and opportunity for everyone? Um, so if you, um, maybe you do or don't know that you're a part of this larger week that's taking place, but we have little brochures outside. I would encourage you to take one, and there are actually three more days of events happening. Uh, we're going to be joined by six different um, uh, national voices and local voices this year, including Dr. Mindy Fulal of today, uh, Majora Carter, Arts in a Changing America, the Government Alliance on Race and Equity, Wing Young Huey, and Dr. Delaney Cobbs tonight at the St. Paul Foundation's Annual Facing Race Ambassador Awards. So. Um, 
We really encourage you to follow us throughout the week. There's still time to sign up for a number of the events, including the culmination uh, at the Great River Gathering on Thursday night. We hope that we'll see you throughout the week. Uh, our hashtag is PlacemakingMSP, so if you're inspired by Mindy and what you're hearing today, we encourage you to uh, post on Facebook, Twitter, whatever your favorite social medium is these days. And of course, uh, this work wouldn't be possible without generous funders and sponsors to support the work. Uh, the Center for, for Prevention at Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Minnesota generously came on board as the presenting sponsor of both the residency and the Great River Gathering this year. Um, so we're very lucky to have them. And the residency was also supported by Bush Foundation, the McKnight Foundation, Wells Fargo, and as I mentioned, uh, the City of St. Paul's ADD Vitality Fellow. So with that, I'm gonna stop babbling and I'm gonna invite Dr. Fuller Love to come up and uh, take us through about, I think it's about 45 minutes and then we'll go into more Q&A and workshop style for the rest of the session. So thanks so much for being here today. Hi, everybody. Hello. Hi. Um, uh oh. It's gone. Hopefully, it still works. It was supposed to show on this thing, but it's gone away. What's that? The screen. Oh, people have seen this before. <laughs> but it, there it is. Thank you. All right. <laughs> Um, so that is really a good example of how the world is supposed to work. So I, I don't know if anybody said I'm a psychiatrist. So I'm not an urban planner, I'm not an architect. I, I, when I think about placemaking, I think about people getting along and having a, a good time, being effective together. And, and I believe as a psychiatrist that the biggest problem that we face right now um, is that we, we are really, really stuck in the United States and we're stuck all around the world, and we're not able to do that essential task of talking to each other. But, so when I couldn't, I couldn't see the screen and she said tap it, that's what's supposed to happen in the world everywhere. And I just thought I would do a, start off with a little survey. So how many of you, when you were teenagers, thought your parents should have listened to you? Possibly? <laughs> how many of you have teenagers that you think should listen to you? Possibly. <laughs> Uh, how many of you think your boss should sometimes listen to you more than he or she does? <laughs> um, how many of you think the president, whoever the president is, should listen to you? <laughs> so um, th this is the point that, and why do you think these people should listen to you? Because you have something to say. And, and the, the real point of the whole thing is that actually everybody has something to say and everybody has something different to say. And, and, the, and the way the world works best is if we can find a way to exchange information. I didn't know how this thing worked. She knew how the thing worked. I said what my problem was. She had a solution. That is how the world works. And when we automatically decide, you can't know the answer to my question because you're a fill in the blank. And we don't ask, that's when the world stops working. So what I wanna address today is, is what I see as an extremely profound crisis in our, in our nation and in the world, that for reasons of religion and ethnicity and income and geography, we are divided. And so we let these superficial characteristics stop us from listening and sharing with other people. And they stop listening to us. And the exchange of information is broken down. And, and so this is why the works are gummed up. Society works because there's a very, very rapid, fast flow of information among all kinds of people. And that's how we get our collective work done. That's how you run a society. So uh, the whole don't drown is, of course, I'm from the East Coast, and we're going to drown. Uh, you apparently have forests, and they burn down. Whatever. <laughs> the, uh, we're in trouble from global warming. It's a big problem. And I don't have the answer, and you don't have the answer. Maybe she has the answer, she might. But, but we're not gonna know that she has the answer unless we say, do you have the answer to global warming? And then she says, yeah, I do, or no, I don't. And if none of us has the answer, we have to sit down and say, so what's the next best thing we could possibly do? And, and that's a very serious conversation. America is in no way ready to have that serious conversation. And this is terrifying. So um, I want to start off by just as an exercise, and I think there's some blank page papers on your tables if you want to take one, because uh, there'll be an exercise at the end. 
I want to ask you to kind of hold four images in your mind. The first is a, a small house in the field neighborhood of Minneapolis, which was bought by the Lee family in 1931. And they were a black couple. He was a World War I veteran. And they were driven out by racism after a very, very brutal fight. Apparently, they had to live in the basement of the house. There were so many attacks on the house. This house is now on the register of historic places. And this is a mural from Sauk City in uh, Minnesota. Sauk City, as I'm sure many of you know, was the small rural town that was the model for Main Street, Sinclair Lewis's famous novel. And this is a mural that's there of a doughboy writing a letter home and dreaming of Sauk City. That's in the imaginary of the American city. This, this is Main Street. Um, posters that are on my way to Sauk City I saw everywhere. Minnesota's growing old. Uh, we are aging. Perhaps you've seen these. And um, how will that affect you? That it affects everyone. Apparently, there used to be twice as many older people. I mean, there are twice as many school children as older people. But now the number of older people and school children are going to be equal here in Minnesota. So what do we do about that? And finally, uh, black Santa Claus. The, so those four images, if you could kind of keep them in mind. And, and I want to say that although the challenge is that we need to work together, we are, are kept apart by redlining, which I'm using here as a metaphor. So redlining is a program instituted by the federal government in the 1930s. They went around and mapped city neighborhoods, and they rated them on basically two criteria. To what extent were they exclusively white and protected by covenants, such as those that protected the field neighborhood and caused such a horrible trauma to the Lee family? And to what extent do they have new buildings? And what they marked as green were those that had restrictive covenants, therefore they were meant to be all white and new buildings. And the older sections that were worn out were where all kinds of people lived. And the point of it was to steer investment to the white restricted neighborhoods where the new houses were. So it was to steer investment in certain select privileged places. Investment is still, all across the United States, steered to certain places. If you look around Minneapolis, if you look around St. Paul, it's not the whole city that's being given money to grow and to prosper. It's certain neighborhoods, and billions and billions and billions of dollars go into those neighborhoods. This is keeping us apart. We aren't, we aren't in a mindset of how do we help everyone, how do we all live together. We're in a mindset of how do we make the green areas even more prosperous. This is very destructive. So this is, a, this is a process that creates, it's built on inequality, and it creates more inequality. But even more importantly than the moral problem of how do we tolerate creating unequal life chances, having some portion of the population die young and live horribly, even more important than that moral problem is the pragmatic problem that you cannot run a society that's broken in this manner. So I, this is a, a drawing by one of my colleagues in uh, the University of Orange, Orby Murdoch, who was thinking about how, how do you take the isolation of resources and infrastructure and people, how do you take these things that are on separate islands, and how do you bring them into relationship so that we can solve our problems, that, that this is what we're dealing with. So I've had the opportunity as psychiatrists of going around and, and watching the work of m many people who are architects, urban planners, community organizers, who are saying, who, who are facing this problem, this exact problem of how do you start to bring the parts that are physically and socially isolated from one another into relationships so that they can have real solidarity? How do you do that? And I learned from them what I call the nine elements of urban restoration, which you see depicted here. And I'm going to walk you through what their advice is for how we ungum the works and get things working again. So there are nine of these urbanists that I'm going to talk about today, though there are many more that I have, whose work I have observed. The, the first principle is keep the whole city in mind. 
And if you think about the, the principle of the redlining map, the redlining map is saying to banks, you only have to worry about the green area. Invest there, don't worry about the other areas. So it's fundamentally a fragmentation of where the gains is going to go. Keep the whole city in mind uh, challenges that. But if you're in a marginalized area, if you're segregated, you've got to keep the gaze on yourself in order to survive because there's no help coming from the outside. You've got to do it yourself. So on both sides of the divide, we're not looking at the whole city. So how do we start from wherever we are to see the whole? I learned this principle from Michelle Cantel Dupar, who was celebrated as a nice modernist by Dwell Magazine, who's a renowned urbanist in France. Um, and this is his uh, retirement party. <laughs> Crazy people in strange outfits playing brass instruments. It was a great party. Um, in Perpignan, which is a city in France uh, nestled between the Mediterranean and the Pyrenees, there was a problem of three sets of housing projects that were marginalized, geographically marginalized, meaning they were put at the margins and the connections between where the housing projects were and the rest of the city were literally very, very difficult. So he said, this disrupts the flow, and especially since the people who were put into these highly marginalized places were people of color. He said, this is, this is in rupture with our sense of urbanism, and we have to make the city one city. As one example of the work that he did to make this city of Perpignan more coherent, he took me to see this project which was taking down a portion of one of the housing projects to open the city up. Um, I think that you can see, I don't know if we can turn some of the lights out. Can we turn some of the front lights out? Yeah. Uh, can you see the chain link fence that's in front mm -hmm. of the building? So I'm standing in the highway, or on the edge of the highway, taking the photograph. And the chain link fence is between us and the housing projects. To get to those housing projects, you have to go all around Robin Hood's barn to get to the other side where that machine is. That's ridiculous, because the fast way to the center of town is, is that highway where I am, but you can't get there. So he said, let's open that up. And here's, this is from the other perspective, the machine at work. And this is what they did. They took a piece of the building, and then they linked to the highway so that it's effortless to go back and forth between the city center and this, this neighborhood. It ceases to be a marginalized neighborhood. They also, uh, you know, in French, they like to use English words the way we like to use French words. Mm -hmm. So they gave it a new look, which is to say, uh, it, which in French is called reloquet. So they have, you can see the building that before was white is now got balconies, got a fancy roof. So it has a whole new look. And each of the buildings in this set of housing projects was given a different look. So instead of, instead of being kind of a boring, it now looks more like a regular neighborhood. They also put in a beautiful park, which creates a linkage between uh, individual houses that held a uh, sort of wealthier part of the neighborhood and the housing projects. So it brings the neighborhood into coherence. This is uh, my team um, who had gone to France to learn about the story of Perpignan. We were with Cantal in a park that he also did, Square Bir Hakim, very fabulous park in the center of the city. And part of what he did was, you can see the fountain in both of these photographs was to take out the parking and create these great sight lines and handsome but very open fencing so that the park is slightly dis distinguished from the right by the streets but not cut off or shut in. The second principle of urban restoration is to find what you're for. And I learned this from my father, Ernest Thompson, who was an organizer with United Electrical Radio and Machine Workers of America, and was, became head of their National Fair Employment Practices Committee in the 1950s. And one of the things that he did while in that office was to work on equal pay for women, which, as we know, is still a problem. We just celebrated Equal Pay Day, which is the day that men have earned as much as women will earn in the whole year. Uh, we celebrated it in April. 
So all the men in the room are now earning <coughs> more than we will earn. It's just awful. So my father worked on this in the 1950s, and they had three national conferences. On this side, you can see a photograph of the chair of the conference holding up a plaque that was being sent to the Montgomery Improvement Association and signed by all the delegates in support of the Montgomery Improvement Association's leadership of the Montgomery boycott. This is while the boycott was going on. And they honored this work, UE honored this work with a mural in solidarity for women workers. And there are three men in the mural, and one of them is my father. So this is because he understood that what he was for was equality. And he had often was very proud of this work because he had nothing personally to gain in, in the way, in the narrow sense of the word. He wouldn't get more pay if women got equal pay. But he understood that the union couldn't be strong if everybody in the union didn't feel supported by the union. And so if women worked for less money, they were going to be resentful. And if, they, if he didn't recognize that and, and bring that into the conversation, the union would be weakened. Therefore, his ability to lead a strong union depended on having equality for women. The third is make a mark. And um, so one of the people whose work has given, been very important for me is Mike Malbro, who's the, in the sunglasses and the shades, an artist who lives in my neighborhood. Um, we had a, a, one of those um, installations in an old factory. And so he did this piece, which I love because I, I think it really illustrates this problem of many people talking but in different directions and not hearing each other. So this is Mike who really tries to bring everybody into the conversation. And all the youth who are part of the arts program he leads, um, we had a bench building contest. And a local woodworker who, um, he just wanted to show how cool he was, got a forester to give him a whole tree, like a tree. And then he, he brought his chainsaw and chainsawed the log into a bench and two side tables. So we had to move it from the library to the art center, so everybody's moving them. But you see, it's a bunch of different people, a bunch of different nationalities, all working together to move the bench. But part of this is about make a mark. How do you express this in, in the landscape? And so this is one of the murals that Mike made with the bench. Um, and so it's this creating statements in the public space of what are you for. This one of the birds singing is, uh, you know, it's, it, it, it's not that art has to somehow explicitly like hit you over the head with a hammer, like we are for equality, but the birds singing in the landscape in a, a, a marginalized old industrial neighborhood is, brings good cheer, brings hope, brings a sense of spring into the space. They, he and the, and the young artists he works with love to do live painting, so there they are live painting, and here's a little further along. Uh, and the live painting is behind. They also decided one day to have a paintball thing and make that whatever. They're, that's Mike in the white outfit. So um, all of that is about making a mark, statements in the public space. The fourth is unpuzzling the fractured space. So one of the things that happens as we are divided from each other and as we come to have, be suspicious of each other and as this whole system is built on being suspicious you know, the, the way in which the Lees were kept out by 4,000 white people protesting in front of their little house. I mean, how much harm could they really do? Um, that is built on suspicion and hostility. So that gets into the space. So we have to figure out how the space works. So one of the people that I've worked with who's done a great deal of this is Terry Baltimore. And this is the two of us in the Hill District of Pittsburgh. Michelle Cantel Park came to consult with us, and he said, look, what you have to understand is that the Hill District, like the neighborhoods in Perpignan, was systematically isolated from the rest of the city by closing off streets, by closing down the incline, which is the funicular railroad, and by cutting off the buses. And these are typical tools of geographic marginalization that make it very difficult for people to get out of the neighborhood and that make it too scary for people who don't live there to go into the neighborhood. And this rupture in the flow of the city is catastrophic for everybody. 
So he said, what you have to do is ask the question, how do we get from here to there? How do we get from the hill where Terry and I are standing down to the river? And that cement block is the foundation of the old incline. So it used to go down to the strip district where the factories were. But it's gone. So how do we get there? And so she led friends and neighbors from the hill in exploring both in the hill and looking out over to the rivers. So, you know, Pittsburgh has three rivers, the Allegheny, the Monongahela, that join to make the Ohio. And then going out onto the rivers um, with boats to look up and see what was up. So really exploring this space to figure out how is it that you make these kinds of connections in a new way to make the hill part of the city again. And there's Terry uh, with Michelle Cantal Dupar in Nantes. She went to France to see another river. Nantes is a, is a riverfront city it's where the Loire meets the Atlantic um, to learn how they were looking at some of these same kinds of issues. The next element is unslum all neighborhoods. So Pat Morrissey in the suit is the head of HANS, Housing and Neighborhood Development Services Incorporated, um, which is a community development corporation in Orange, New Jersey, that has done a great deal of work to preserve the housing infrastructure. Um, his basic thesis was that if HANS could take the most troubled, difficult properties and bring them back to life, come on, oops then um, this, it would protect wide areas around it. And this turns out to have been true. So this is a group going around and, and seeing some of the, I, this is the neighborhood that I live in. It's called the Valley. It's an orange, West Orange neighborhood. Um, that's the Adams Bar, which was actually so far gone that we, it, hands had to take it down. Um, this is an old firehouse, which has now been rehabilitated and which is uh, an art space and apartments. And this is, one of the historic hat factories, Orange at one time was a center of hat manufacturing and produced 4.2 million hats. This has been in the process of being renovated and people will actually be moving in August 1st of this year, which is a, a huge accomplishment for bringing back and re-energizing this old industrial neighborhood. So that's looking out one of the windows of the Berg and the, the beautiful spaces. And that's from the outside. The, the building that says lease is a is a powerhouse, was a powerhouse for the factories, which has already been renovated, and there are three small businesses that work in there. In, in doing this, this placemaking work, we, we, we run the danger, the danger in placemaking work, uh, it, two dangers. One is that we make a place beautiful, and then it gentrifies and pushes out the people who are there. And the second danger is that we make a place beautiful, but we don't connect it to any other place. We just make an, another island. We don't need to push anybody around, and we don't need to make more islands. So one of the ways of addressing this is to create meaningful places. So Dan Rothschild and Ken Doino, who are architects in Pittsburgh, have done a lot of this kind of work and thought a great deal about this problem. So they were asked to, they got the, they were designing a senior center in the Hill District. And so this is the Hill, this is urban renewal in the process, and then urban renewal, which took down a third of the neighborhood, the, the commercial heart of the neighborhood, and replaced it with that spaceship thing, and destroyed the connection, the organic connection, between the black neighborhood and the downtown of Pittsburgh. So this was extremely disastrous for the city. Um, but it also meant that the history of jazz was, was really lost. The history of the Hill District as a place of jazz. And in my studies of urban renewal, all of the urban renewal neighborhoods that I've had the opportunity to read about or to visit were places where there were jazz clubs. And it was very difficult for jazz clubs to move out of these near downtown neighborhoods to neighborhoods further out. Neighborhoods further out are more residential and less commercial, and jazz clubs just don't fit. Plus, they're further away from downtown where the people who want to go hear jazz are circulating. So it's very disastrous, and people have often blamed television and air conditioning for the death of jazz. But I think that it's urban renewal in the 50s and 60s that really bears the blame. The point is this great history exists, 
And Dan Rothschild asked himself, how does jazz relate to a building? So you, you might answer this question simplistically, we'll make a building and then we'll put a saxophone on the outside. And he said, is there a better answer? So what he noticed was that music, musical notes are, have space. So a quarter note takes up less space than a whole note. And jazz is syncopated, so it's not dum, 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 right? It's, it's more irregular rhythms. And he thought, could you, could you translate that into space and then make the building facades have that kind of syncopated rhythm? And then, furthermore, could you put the names of the jazz greats on the building? And that's what they were able to do. They actually held, got a ballot and had people vote for their favorite jazz musicians from the neighborhood. And um, so this is the legacy, which is a fabulously beautiful building that people really love. The sixth is to strengthen the region. And one of the great things about cities is that they power much larger areas. And um, many people, and I am certainly among them, believe that cities are the engine, engine of culture, engine of the economy, and that having strong cities is essential to having basically a sane world. So how do you do that? So these are some of um, our public health students with Lourdes uh, Rodriguez, who's uh, founder of a project we call CLIMB, City Life is Moving Bodies, which is using the creation of a hiking trail to link several northern Manhattan neighborhoods that were ethnically different and therefore thought of as different. So Harlem, which was African American, and Washington Heights, which was Dominican, Inwood, which was Dominican, but, but African American and Dominican were different, and so the neighborhoods were, were just disconnected from each other. So the point of our hiking trail was to go through the middle of that and create a, a common ground. So you can see in the old redlining map how the space is divided by socioeconomic status. And when you, so this is Lourdes with our climb trail map. What's important is that when you look at the climb trail map, you don't see any socioeconomic status. You just see the line of green parks. And a very clever and imaginative graduate student of ours saw not only a line of green parks, but somehow saw a giraffe. So this became Giraffe Path. And when Michel Cantal du Parc came to advise us on this, he said, you know, if you include the cloisters, you'll have a better head for your giraffe. Right now your giraffe doesn't have a head. <laughs> But the point is that you see northern Manhattan in a different way. You don't see it as divided by ethnicity. You see it as one place that has a lot in common. When we started working on this project, the parks had been abandoned, especially Highbridge Park had been abandoned for a long time. And so there were stairs that were in complete ruins. But you can see how, how beautiful, space was incredibly beautiful, uh, but very frightening. So how do you, how do you welcome people back to their park? How do you reclaim it? Um, there were a lot of homeless people living in the parks and all kinds of things that were going on that were just, um, that you could take part in if you wanted to, but if you were mostly like just trying to take your kids to the park to play baseball, you wouldn't go there. So we started a party called Hike the Heights and this is our crew uh, back in our first, very first Hike the Heights. And you can see the hiking giraffe on our t-shirts. That's our, our logo. Um, and so here we are with a clown and balloons. And so we did a lot of work to understand these parks. It's Michelle Cantal du Parc with our team on a very, very icy day. Um, we took generations of students to walk in the parks to help us understand them. And we had generations of parties. So part of what has happened is the restoration of the parks. Um, if you look closely in this photo, you'll see that the stairs that were in ruins have now been repaired, they've been restored. And what we are most excited about is that a bridge, a pedestrian bridge that had been locked for 40 years is now open again for everyone to use. This represents $90 million of investment in these northern Manhattan parks. And we are very proud to have been part of the advocacy for that and, and the reclaiming of the parks for people's use. Show solidarity with all life is the next principle of urban restoration. It's that ultimately, if we're doing this work, if we're getting out and meeting people, it's breaking down barriers. It's, it's, we get to know people, we get to love them, and their problems become our problems, and our problems become their problems. And therefore, we come to have solidarity. But some people really understand this 
instinctively. Um, so my daughter Molly Kaufman is one of those people who just lives solidarity and always has. Here she is with a bunch of kids from the Harlem Children's Zone who had just hiked Highbridge Park. Part of Highbridge Park is a forest. And uh, you see how excited they are? Um, that's because they kept imagining that they saw snakes all the way through the forest. <laughs> she told them they might see a snake. So everyone says, I see a snake, I see a snake. And they were terrified. And as soon as they got out, they said, can we go again? So they had a really good time hiking to the party. Um, Molly also led the work making an earth oven in, um, in the parking lot next door to the Youth Arts Center where Mike Malbro leads his program. And she's also the head of our Free People's University of Orange. So she's really the person who, who gives us all leadership about how to be in solidarity. Like just, just getting to know people, getting out. What are the things that get us out into the world to get to know other people and to support them? So one of the things we have, you have to do to graduate from the University of Orange, and you may be asking yourself, what is a free people's university and how do you graduate? Because I'm thinking of going back to school. Um, yeah. So our university, you have to graduate, you have to vote, you have to go to a city, a city meeting, you have to take two classes, any classes you want to take. Um, you have to have fun with your neighbors and you have to volunteer. The hardest thing to do is get people to a city meeting. So we actually, once a year, just before graduation, we graduate, obviously, a free people's university that gives the degree of be free. You graduate on Juneteenth, which many people know is the day that uh, people in Texas learned a few years late that blacks had been emancipated. Um, so, so these are the kids who are involved in the youth arts program at the city council meeting getting ready to graduate from the University of Orange. And this photo is from a few years ago. But what's important is that not only were they there then, but just a couple weeks ago, these same kids organized the only mayoral debate to go on in the city of Orange during the current hotly contested elections. So they have grown up to be leaders of the city, taking real responsibility for what goes on in that city council chambers. They had to go to some really boring meetings to get the point. <laughs> It is the hardest thing to get people to do for the graduation. They'll take a lot of courses, they'll volunteer, but go to a city meeting, they'll say, oh, I, I, can I, does it count that I heard there was one? <laughs> <laughs> and there they are giving a, a, a big party um, at the Youth Arts Center um, and the Earth Oven in, in, in operation. The last part is that you have to celebrate your accomplishments and this is fundamental because making cities better is a very slow process. And if we think about all the successes that we've had, uh, think about everything, right? Think about everything that we thought of as a success and how we have new versions of the same old problems now that we're struggling with. Um, it could be discouraging. But so you just have to remember what you're for do it in solidarity, and celebrate your accomplishments. So Beas Bolidoro, who's an Italian architect, who, uh, cousin of Ken Doino and works at Rothschild Doino Collaborative in Pittsburgh, did an amazing job of organizing a party when my book, Urban Alchemy, came out. I had given a speech the year before in Pittsburgh called The Meaning of Things, Pittsburgh's 21st Century Triumph Over 20th Century Urban Renewal. And it was a, it was a big speech at the August Wilson Center, and um, so we had a party, and we had all the people who helped organize this beach are in this photo. Uh, the point of this great photo was that, that the, the men who organized Pittsburgh's urban renewal and built the Civic Center were 60-year-old white men in fancy suits, and they all had their picture taken in the Mellon Bank. So I wanted there to be a picture of the people who organized my talk, and that's who they are. Th th those are the leaders of, of Pittsburgh today. It's a, it's a different place and a different world, and th this is what we're excited about. So, Bea Spolodoro looked back at what had happened around that, the set of events ar around my talk, and said, who are we? These are all the people that were involved. And she said, so what happened at the talk? Not so much in my talk, but in the conversation afterwards. What did people have to say? And she did a brilliant piece of analysis. And what emerged from her analysis was this remarkable observation. 
we need a table. Uh, she quoted Ronald Reagan, which all the Americans thought was pretty funny. Um, but he says, it's, it's one of those things where he says something interesting. He says, all great change in America begins at the dinner table. Now, I don't know about you, but I would never quote Ronald Reagan. <laughs> but he says something smart, right? So it's one of those things where you, know, you have to open your mind all the time. So I said at the lecture, maybe we need a bigger table. Maybe we need to invite more people to it. I'm sure we do. But there is a table now that didn't exist before. And that, that was the point of my lecture about Pittsburgh's 21st century triumph over 20th century urban renewal. That most people in Pittsburgh were excluded from the conversation about urban renewal. But in the 21st century, those people are, are fighting to get in. They're being let in. It's a much bigger conversation. So Bea said we need more tables, bigger tables, more welcoming tables, more public tables. We need them to discuss, to understand, to create, to celebrate. So we organized the, the book lunch, had two sessions. The first was a dinner. And you can see it's around the welcoming table. And the placemats at the welcoming table were the periodic table of the elements of urban restoration, which are the core of the book Urban Alchemy. And the second day, what we did, which was more of a public talk, uh, was to, but the same room, was that each of the urbanists that was in Pittsburgh or could get to Pittsburgh talked about these elements of urban restoration. I'm representing their work to you. But it was great at the lunch to have them there representing their own work. So Ken Doino talked about his work. And Molly Kaufman talked about her work. But notice that we're all sitting at this table. So it's another version of the table. And then afterwards, so that's me and Ken and Dan at, at the book signing. All of us were at the table. And people came down. And we all, each of us, signed their books. So Urban Alchemy is about the work of these people. But these people are co-storytellers. They helped me write the book. And so they autographed the book. And it was a, it was a great, great, great event. Um, but it's all built around this concept that we need a table. So an urbanist party isn't simply a party like, let's get drunk and pass out. It's, it's a party of, of learning. Uh, so we have a lot of fun, but we're, we're with people. We think about all the great things we did. We have great food. But we're also really taking some time to understand where we are, where we've come from, where we're going. We take time to learn. And that's at the core of an urbanist party and how we celebrate our work. So the question is how to make this, right? how to transform this. And I asked permission to read you from this children's book, Patrick Looks for Diversity by Patrick Robles. So Patrick was in my urban space and health class this spring. And at the end, everybody does a poster, which means whatever they think of as a poster. And he decided that writing a children's book would be his poster. So it starts, once upon a time in a busy, busy city called New York, there was a school named Mailman. Many spark children attended Mailman, and they learned important lessons. Some students learned how people became sick, while other students learned how to stop people from becoming sick. Patrick was one of those students. So he goes on to say that he heard about my work, making a park fun again. And so Mindy's students learned of how Mindy helped the park, and they wanted to do the same. So they thought really, really hard about how they could help. Mindy saw their students wanted to help, so she introduced them to her friend Jane Jacobs, the great American urbanist. Jane Jacobs was so smart, even Mindy looked up to her. Jane noticed things that were sometimes hard to see. One of the students named Patrick wanted to help an awful lot. When he told Jane how much he wanted to help, Jane told him some of the things she knew. She told him how important it was to have different things in the same place. Jane called this diversity and told Patrick that diversity could make New York a healthier place. So Patrick and his friends thought about how they could use diversity. And the first thing they did was to go look for it. They went to Central Park, and they didn't find it. They went to Melman, and they didn't find it. This isn't diversity, muttered Patrick. Seeing that Patrick was struggling to find diversity, Mindy told him to make his own. She told him and his friends to meet Coach Dave in a place called Coogan's. Mindy told them that Coach Dave would show Patrick and his friends diversity. So Coach Dave is a local leader in Washington Heights who leads an incredible group called 
Team Dreamers, and has been doing this work with kids in, in the Washington Heights neighborhood for 20 years. It is exactly 100 feet across the street from Columbia, but because it's across Broadway, nobody would ever go there. So Patrick was not so sure, since he had had trouble finding diversity. But he listened to Mindy anyway, and he met Coach Dave. And Coach Dave said, let's have a party. So on the night of the party, so many people came. There was lots of food and drinks, and the prizes were laid out on the table. And teacher Robert Fullylove and head teacher Linda Freed came. She's the dean of our School of Public Health. And Coach Dave and his friends asked all their pals, and there were adults and kids. It was a big, wonderful fundraising party. Everybody had fun. Patrick was still looking for diversity, so he looked and looked, but he had trouble seeing it. He looked under the tables. He looked at the walls. He even took a long, hard look at the prizes. Just when he was about to shake his head again, Patrick had an idea. This is diversity. Look at all the people that are here. People I would never have met unless I came to visit Coach and his friends. We even use Coogan's to have a big party. No one ever comes here to have a party, certainly not a party that the head teacher would attend. This is diversity. Jane had told Patrick that diversity was important, so he looked far and wide for it. Instead, Patrick realized that sometimes you have to create your own diversity in your friends and in the spaces you use. The end. So the question is how to make this, this. And we would like to uh, break you into groups and have you work together on how that question resonates for you. And then we would like to have you have one collective thought from your table after about half an hour. And um, then we will hear from each of the tables. And I think we'll also do Q&A then. So we'll blend Q&A and the report back. We'll have the report back, and then we'll have Q&A and see where everybody's head is at. And we want you to take half an hour to do this exercise. Are there any questions about the exercise? Great. So the, remember, the, the assignment is, how do we make this? So money, people, infrastructure, resources, isolated from each other. And how do we bring them into relationship so that we can solve the great problems of the world? So take half an hour. That will bring us to 3.30 by this clock. <laughs>